and now let me go on to the auscultation. I was taking examination in the um, Gujarat University, maybe in 2000, maybe in 2000 around. And there is a one ultrasound case. In ultrasound case, what happens? The examiner is standing and candidate is standing and examiner will ask something and candidate has to do that within maybe 2-3 minutes. So, suppose I, I ask one of the candidate do the auscultation of the right infrascapular area. So, what he did? He just auscultated, just heard the breath sound and finished. So, I said your auscultation is not complete until unless you uh, w what is visible for distance until unless you ask the patient to say 1, 2, 3 how the auscultation and when you auscultate you have always three aims in your mind. First what is breath sounds like, second if there is any accompaniment and third, what is ocal resonance? I have already said to you, ocal frematus and resonance, they have similar meaning. It is how you demonstrate is different. So, to answer the first question that is, what is breath sounds? That you have to first understand, what are the common breath sounds which a clinician can listen. First, until unless you understand this, you will never be able to appreciate the breath sounds. And uh, normally, you know, we have two types of breath sound. Normally, I am saying, because our normal chest, you can listen it. First, normal breathing is known as vesicular breathing and another breathing is bronchial breathing. Now, when I say what are the differences between vesicular breathing and bronchial breathing, vesicular breathing means when air is passing through the normal lung, you listen a vesicular breathing. Bronchial breathing means when 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 you pass when, when air is passed through the bronchial tree, what you listen is the bronchial breathing. Normally, normally to be very in general. But what are the differences between vesicular and bronchial breathing? Now, differences are in four, four issues. The first difference could be in the duration of sound. When I say duration of sound, suppose this is inspiration occurring and this is expiration occurring. So, what you listen in vesicular breathing, you listen whole of the inspiratory phase and then one third of expiratory phase. So, duration of vesicular breathing, what you listen full inspiration and only one third of expiration. So, that is why we always say ratio between expiration and inspiration is 1 is to 3. And what you listen in bronchial breathing as far as duration is concerned. You listen in, this is inspiration, this is expiration. So, what you listen is whole of the inspiratory phase except at the end and then you listen whole of the expiratory phase. So, here the ratio become 1 is to 1. And of course, there is a gap which I will talk little later. So, this is how the breathing, both the breathing are different as compared as in terms of duration of sound. What is the second difference? Is the character of sound. If you ask me, sir, how you recognize bronchial and vesicular breathing, I will tell it is the character of sound. And for character of sound, what is typically described in vesicular bleeding, it is rustling in character. And in bronchial bleeding, it is described hollow 
oblique aspirate in character. Now, it is very difficult to, to define in the words, but I always say as I say the character is very important to, dif to differentiate between these two types of breathing, you can hear with your own chest, you have not to go to any patient. <coughs> You listen over your, over your chest, whatever character you are listening, if your chest is normal, it is rustling in character. You put your stethoscope over the trachea, whatever character of sound you are listening here, this is hollow and aspirate. So, what I always tell my students, you need not to go to the patient, you just practice on your own body you can find out what is rustling and what is hollow because this is the main point by which we at least I identify whether it is a vesicular breathing or bronchial breathing. What is the third difference is the intensity of sound. In if you concentrate here when I say intensity there are two inspiratory sound and expiratory sound. So, in case of vesicular breathing, if I put inspiratory at 2 plus and expiratory as 1 plus, so in vesicular breathing, it is the inspiratory sound which is more intense. So, prominent sound what you listen is inspiratory because whole of the phase you listen and then intensity wise it is more prominent. What is the intensity of sound in bronchial breathing? Similar way inspiration and expiration, inspirator is 2 plus, so it is as intense as vesicular breathing and expiratory I represent as 3 plus. So, here although both the phases are very intense, but it is the expiratory phase which is more intense, that is another difference. So, and fourth difference is whatever explained here about the gap, there is no gap negative and there is a gap in bronchial breathing. So, that is how vesicular and bronchial breathing is recognized. Although these four differences are there, but to my understanding mainly these breathings are recognized by character of the sound and that I have already explained to you, you need not to go to any patient, you can listen, daily listen on your own chest and on your own trachea, you may find what is rustling and what is hollow. Now, when you, there are certain variation of vesicular breathing and there are certain variation of bronchial breathing. Now, if you see vesicular breathing, concentrate here, if it becomes like this, this, th this was here, if it becomes like this, whole of the phase is you are listening, means what this breathing is. So, first variation of bronchial breathing which is very common is the vesicular breathing with prolonged expiration. And another, many books have written it differently, they say harsh vesicular breathing. So, it is very clear what is harsh vesicular breathing, a vesicular breathing with prolonged expiration is the, is, and it is very important to a clinician. I always say, if you cannot recognize a harsh vesicular breathing, it is very difficult to become a good chest physician. Harsh vesicular breathing tells you that there is a airway obstruction. Simple example I can put to you, if somebody is coughing and you listen harsh vesicular breathing, it means his cough is basically because <coughs> of some airway obstruction. So, it is not the cough suppressant which is going to help this patient. Any amount of cough suppressant will not relieve cough. What will relieve cough? Either the expectorant, some secretion, something are there or some bronchodilator. So, that is that is a message very clear to a physician. So, for that you have to first recognize this, this variation of vesicular breathing. The variation of 
vesicular breathing could be because of the intensity. You know that very common, you may find more intense vesicular breathing. Can anybody name more intense vesicular breathing? His name is puerile. Puerile. Padha nahi hoga kabhi tum nahi. Puerile means intensity is increased. It is usually found in children. And then suppose one lung has been removed over the other lung, you may get more intense vesicular breath sounds. This is increased intensity and very common type of variation of vesicular breathing is the decrease in intensity. Decrease are absent. Decreased vesicular breath sounds are are, are the absent vesicular breath sound. It goes with pneumothorax, it goes with hydropneumothorax, it goes with collapse, sometimes it goes with fiber. Many things can happen to the decrease. So, that is the variation of vesicular breathing, means in duration and in intensity. What are the variations of bronchial breathing? Now, you know, you listen normally the three types of bronchial breathing. The one is tubular. Tubular means high pitched bronchial breathing. And it translates to a clinician that there is a consolidation. But catch point is not all consolidation will produce tubular breathing. Where you are caught in the examination, you just see the x-ray and you try to translate the x-ray into the physical finding. Physical finding is always not possible. So, but once you listen a tubular breathing, it is that there must be consolidation in the x-ray. The next variation is cavernous. Cavernous means low pitched bronchial breathing and it implies cavity. Reverse is again true that not all the cavities will produce a cavernous breathing. For cavity to produce a cavernous breathing, there should be a sufficient size, there should be communication with the endobranchial tree. So, those there are certain prerequisites why a cavity will produce a cavernous type of breathing. The third variation of bronchial breathing is, is the amphoric breathing. Although newer books, newer, newer clinical methods, they have removed all these because they do not listen. But we listen in our day to day clinical practice. What is amphoric breathing? Amphoric breathing is once you listen, you will never forget in your life. Amphoric breathing is the Essentially, it is a low pitched breathing like cavernous, but associated with high pitched overtones. That is why you find, you sound, you, you listen a very musical type of a breathing. Once you, you, once you listen, you will never forget in your life. And the causes, so cavernous breathing means cavity, um, tubular breathing means consolidation, amphoric breathing means two things. One, either there is a pneumothorax or hydropneumothorax with patent bronchopleural fistula, means open type of a pneumothorax or hydropneumothorax. And the second cause for amphoric breathing is a giant cavities communicating with the bronchus. Of course, breathing will only be there when it is communicates with bronchus. So, a size of more than four centimeter even bigger than that you may get in. So, if you are listening an amphoric breathing what as a clinician I know that I have to I have to search to call either there is a big cavity or there is a pneumo or hydro pneumothorax with open type of a hydro or pneumothorax hydro pneumothorax and pneumothorax. So, that is about the so there are three variations in India we still listen these types of breathing, if you can, but in exams what if you are not able to differentiate, 
but I, but you can very clearly differentiate between amphoric and other breathings very clearly but if you are not tell bronchial breathing but if you can appreciate you can subclassify them that's about the variation of the bronchial breathing now yet there is yet another type of uh, breathing which is known as <coughs> which i used to say it is in between bronchial and vesicular that's why i am putting here is known as bronco vesicular breathing newer books have all removed this type of breathing so this is not don't confuse from here this is a harsh vesicular breathing and this is a bronco vesicular breathing and when i said that it is in between so it is between vesicular and bronchial breathing how you recognize bronco vesicular breathing now as i said i recognize bronchial breathing by character of the sound so to say bronchial breathing idly both the phases should have hollow or aspirating character when one phase is like bronchial and another phase is like vesicular when i say bronchial and vesicular means character so one phase is many times you listen in your day to day clinical practice that both the phases are not hollow it's only one phase is hollow when i was a student there is a bronco vesicular and there is a vesicolo bronchial depending upon which phase is hollow but this is very clear finding we even listen today that the if only one phase is hollow so one, like bronchial and another phase is like rustling or vesicular type we call it as bronco vesicular breathing question arises what is the significance of bronco vesicular breathing the first significance what you have to remember that uh, bronco vesicular breathing can be normally heard and what are the areas where it can be normally heard bronco vesicular breathing actually is listening or breathing through a very superficial bronchus especially in a thin chested individual so what are those areas where you can listen sometimes uh, bronco vesicular breathing and sometimes even bronchial breathing and those are the areas especially in the right infraclavicular area why because here the right main bronchus are in close approximation with the chest wall if the person is thin chested start practicing from tomorrow if a person is thin chested you may listen definitely a bronco and sometimes even a bronchial breathing and the, what is the another area where normally bronco vesicular breathing is heard is the at the root of the lung lies around t2 and t3 in the back around the spine of the scapula you may listen the bronco vesicular breathing because there the trachea is very close contact with the chest wall so these are the two areas so bronco vesicular breathing there are two significance one it can be normally heard that you have to always remember and the second if it is not normally heard then bronco vesicular breathing is taken as a bronchial breathing whatever is the causes of bronchial breathing those causes like consolidate you know if somebody consolidation is complete suppose in the resolving stage you may not listen bronchial breathing you may listen a bronco vesicular breathing like some collapse like some fibrosis idea is that when superficial bronchus lies they have come very close contact to the chest wall you can imagine such type of a vesicular bronco vesicular breathing that's about this is the what i was interested to tell you what are the common type of breath sounds which are you can listen if you know in theory you can listen it also believe me i listen it daily in my clinical practice and whoever sits with me i i usually ask them just listen and tell me what is type of breathing so that was the when you say auscultation that was the first aim is the is the is the is the breathing type of breathing what is the uh, accompaniments 
Now there are usually three types of accompaniments. What you call is rankai is one, kreps is another and plural rub is third. So these are three common type of accompaniments which you can listen. Rankai as you know, most of you know it is a continuous type of sound. And Rankai could be generalized and could be localized. Now generalized Rankai are common. As you know Rankai goes with the airway, partial airway obstruction, not complete airway obstruction. Complete airway obstruction there will be no entry, there is no question of Rankai. So it is a partial airway obstruction. And partial airway obstruction, usual diseases are chronic bronchitis, asthma, COPD. These are the diseases where you can get commonly you listen ronchi. Heart vesicular breathing with ronchi, they are the common finding in airway obstructive lung disease. Now, localized ronchi is not <coughs> common, but there is a dictum you should always remember. Localized rankai, if it is not persistent, it is not important. Suppose somebody you are listening rankai at one place and you ask the patient to cough and rankai disappears, this is not important. Why this is not important? There may be some mucus plugging which has partially obstructed one of the bronchus and you may listen localized rankai, ask the patient to cough and it dislodges and rankai disappears. So, rankai which is localized, which is not persistent is not important. Locali rankai which is localized and which is persistent is important to a clinician. As generalized rankai indicates generalized obstruction. So, localized rankai also indicates the same thing that is a localized obstruction. Now, question is what are the causes of localized obstruction, partial obstruction. Localized partial obstruction may be when the obstruction is outside the endobronchial tree means some lymph node pressing partially the bronchus some tumor may press from the outside the bronchus can may create a localized bronchi. The cause of partial obstruction in the wall of the bronchus like endobronchial tuberculosis like again malignancy can be within the from the from the walls. And the localized obstruction may be from within the lumen and here example is foreign body aspirates. I would like to tell you one of the story which I diagnosed one of the one of the professor of when I was in KGMC again it is a story of 2000 near about 2000. Uh, one of the professor came to my house all of a sudden because we were closed door neighbors. He came to me and he said to me Rajin I am feeling breathless all of a sudden. Uh, but because I was knowing him he has been my teacher he had no asthma no COPD. But all of a sudden he started feeling breathlessness, not very severe one, mild breathlessness. So he just immediately came to me, I auscultated his chest, as usual I did the examination. I, I did general examination I, I, as, as I told you, uh, because I was seeing to, uh, whether you see a professor, whether you see a general man, do the same thing. So I did a full examination and what could only positive find, I could find in him is the localized rankai. I asked him to cough, probably it might disappear, but it was a persistent localized. So, I asked him sir whether you have aspirated something in the previous night. So, he said no, I am ok, but the morning I woke up I am getting breathless. So, when we I got the x-ray done, but so history was not supportive. So, I got the x-ray done, what I can, what could, could I found to my utter surprise in x-ray, there was a tooth like structure in the x-ray. So, it was a crown. So, I asked sir, it is something like tooth. So, when he saw his uh, 
uh, he's opened his mouth. That's why I said in general examination also these things are very important. So, so he, he saw that his, his gold, he, he, he was wearing a golden crown. So, that was missing. Holy, my, where is my crown? And then some crown is inside the chest. So, what was the cause of the localized rankai, which is persistent, is the foreign body aspiration. I know that uh, immediately we got that foreign body removed and he got okay. So, what I am trying to say, these findings are not just to write on the case sheet. As a clinician, you have to interpret. So, that is the importance of a localized rankai. So, as I said, generalized rankai means very common diseases. Localized rankai is not common diseases, but if it is persistent, you must think what could be the cause of a localized rankai you must investigate the patient. Then this is the rankai and what is the another accompaniment which is very common is a crepes. Now crepes there is a lot of change are happening, but as I told you that crepes are intermittent sound, I will take another class how to differentiate between various type of crepes in various diseases. I have another package, but here I just to complete the auscultation. I would like to tell you that crepes are fine and coarse, although now people have started talking phase wise, <coughs> which phase crepes are, but big fine and coarse also depend on that. Fine crepes are those crepes, I always ask a question, not I, everybody asks this question, what do you mean by fine crepes? It is not by fine tuning and what not and what not, by the, which is fine crepes means the crepes which are present in <coughs> the late inspiration is fine crepes, very simple definition. So, late inspiratory crepes are fine crepes, rest of the crepes if you ask me can you categorize as a coarse crepe, but coarse crepes are usually present in both the phases, usually, but it may be in one phase. So, Fine, what do you mean by fine crepes? What it suggests to a clinician? Suppose you listen, suppose you percussed and you find the impaired note at one of the apex or one of the base and you find a fine crepes there and inspiratory crepes, diagnosis is very obvious. Either it may be early disease, something like pneumonia, something like tuberculosis, something like early ILDs, you get the, the late inspiratory crepes. Sometimes you get early inspiratory crepes, in ILDs you get all sides of crepes, in late inspiratory, early inspiratory, pan inspiratory. So, this is a, but most of the crepes of ILDs are inspiratory crepes, inspiratory crepes. In case of, so fine crepes means any early disease which is involving at the quite extreme end of the endobranchial T means alveolus and acinus and other issues. Coarse crepitation usually as I said they could be present in both the phases and uh, this ideal cause is usually the this source of coarse crepitations either in the major bronchus like COPD, bronchitis, all diseases, bronchiectasis again coarse crepitation. Dictum is if the persistent coarse crepitation whether with the with the symptom or without symptom, if the coarse crepes is persistent in a localized area, it is bronchiectasis. Because why crepes? Because there the bronchi is localized dilated and their sec pool of secretions are always there, whether it is infected, whether it is not infected. But pool of secretion will always be there. That is why we always say that coarse crepitation, if it is persistent in a localized area, it is bronchiectasis. Coarse capitation, if it is generalized, it is COPD. Another causes of coarse capitation may be, it may source of it may be in cavities. There is lot of secretion in the cavity, there also you can get a coarse capitation. That is how you react with a coarse capitation. Mind it, I am talking to you approach to a patient. I am not talking to how to do these things that will take another time, but here we know how to approach. Suppose you listen a rankai, you listen a localized rankai, you listen a fine crepes, you listen a coarse crepes, how, how it helps you? 
in making the diagnosis or deciding the therapy. The third accompaniment is pleural rub. Pleural rub is again, it is, since it is a rub, cause of pleural rub is usually the pleural diseases. Pleural disease means any inflammation in the pleura. It may be malignant, it could be pyogenic, it could be malignant, pyogenic, tubercular, any, any inflammation when pleura rubs against each other, when they are thickened, so you may find a pleural rub. How to differentiate between pleural rub and coarse crepitation? Usually there is a question. Pleural rub usually it is a rubbing type of sound. Crepes are intermittent type of sound. Pleural rub, when you ask the patient to cough, the <coughs> crepes may change. Pleural rub will not change. You press the stethoscope over the chest wall, the pleural rub might increase in intensity. The crepes, it will have no change. So, these are the few points and pleural rub, another point I used to say it is a common sense. Whenever you find a pleural rub, it will always be associated with chest pain. Chest pain. So, ask the patient, where is your chest pain? And sometimes you auscultate there, you will find a pleural rub. Another thing what you have to remember, especially I talk when I talk pleural, that pleural, in suppose there is a pleural effusion. So, in the beginning of pleural effusion, when there is inflammation of the pleura, there will be pain. When pleura separates, when there is fluid, pain will automatically disappear. And when you treat these pleural effusions, when pleura will come again with contact with each other, and if the inflammation persists by that time, then it will again rub and pain will again appear. So, those points probably nitty gritty, you have to tell your patient that we are treating, you have disease like this, pain may come. Many of the patients come to us, <coughs> pain sir has reappeared, has come again, sir fada nahi ho raha, pain, pain fir honne laga. So, that is, that as a clinician you have to, that is the pleural rub. Finally, to complete the auscultation, what is the third component of the auscultation is the ocal resonance. And as I said earlier also, ocal resonance and vocal fremitus are the same thing. Whatever you have to tell in fremitus, the same thing probably will finding will be there in vocal resonance. And in vocal resonance, what you ask to say, one, two, three, slowly, not very loudly. Then you will be able to appreciate, one, two, three, one, two, three, one, two, three. And listen with your stethoscope and compare from other side. So, in vocal resonance, it could be a normal vocal resonance, it could be increase in vocal resonance and it could be decrease or absent vocal. So, it can move in all the directions. Normal vocal resonance, suppose you ask your patient, how you define normal vocal resonance? You ask your patient to say 1, 2, 3 and it gives you impression that it is, these sounds are generated at the level of chest piece. Then you call it as normal vocal resonance. And if so, it gives you impression that this sound is nearer to your ears, then it means vocal resonance is increased. And if you find no sound or less sound or no sound, so local resonance is decreased or absent. Now, increased vocal resonance has one or two more sets, what people talk about. Increased vocal resonance may be increased to the extent what you call it as whispering pectoral key, highest increase. It means when you test for whispering pectoral key, you ask your patient not to speak 1, 2, 3, not say 1, 2, 3, 1, but to whisper 1, 2, 3. And these whispered words are so clearly audible that somebody is directly speaking, whispering into your ears. This is known as whispering pectoral key. And whispering pectoral key are increase in vocal resonance. These are the states of increased vocal resonance will be accompanied with bronchial breathing 
are bronchovesicular breathing, not with the heart's vesicular breathing. So, if you find increased vocal resonance or whispering pectoral key, always whenever you say there is a bronchial, a rule you have made, wherever there is a bronchial breathing, whether you listen, whether you don't listen, usually you don't listen. But you say, sir, there is a whispering pectoral key. But rule says similar thing that where there is a bronchial breathing or bronchovesicular breathing. There could be increased in vocal resonance, it may be in the tune of whispering pectoral. And another, uh, another increased vocal resonance is called as egophony. Egophony is again a set of increased vocal resonance. What is egophony? Egophony is when you ask the patient to speak 1, 2, 3, the nasal tinge is added to these spoken words. And egophony suggests again either it is present over the consolidation or over eh? nasal tinge, it is what people nasal tinge is added. So, nasal tinge is added to this and this is known, this is found usually over the consolidation sometimes not always or else at the top level of the pleural effusion. So, this is known as egophony and egophony is again a short of an increase in vocal resonance and this is usually uh, when, when the nasal, nasal character, uh, nasal tinge is added to the spoken words, this is known as egophony. That uh, finishes the auscultation and uh, let me uh, summarize and say take home messages that uh, physical, when I say after a history you start doing a physical examination and physical examination will consist of general examination, system involved first and the final thing comes to finish this examination is the rest of the other system. Now, I would like to say one or two line, when I say rest of the other things and that is the third component of the physical examination. So, that uh, not that in every patient you are going to do all the system. Suppose somebody is coughing and you started doing a jaw jerk or knee jerk or plantar extensor, so patient will feel very awkward. Patient probably will feel, are you a doctor, are you a mad person? So, what this, but this is a very essential component, third component is also very important. No? What you have to decide is that what are the real system where you may have got some findings. Like uh, I always give examples, suppose you got right sided pleural effusion. I usually ask, most of the examiners ask, what next system is important? Abdomen is important because right sided effusion, right sided uh, pneumonia, right sided anything may come from below the diaphragm. So, let us examine what is there in abdomen. If something is there or not, likewise you have to be imaginative and you have to, well in some of the patient probably you have to uh, go for the jerks, you have to go for the knee reflexes and ankle because if, 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 if you are suspecting that type of a disease, so what is meaning by other system, ideally all the system should be examined, but to cut short the time, what is the essential system where, where you are likely to get some finding that always in exam people ask, what other system would like to examine? Depending upon your case scenario, you have to think that what other system may be very important. As I, as I always say uh, that somebody had hemoptysis, probably I must have talked this in history. If you have a hemoptysis, what is the other system? Cardiovascular. I know that 15, 20 percent of the, uh, so whether it is history taking, whether it is physical examination, you have to be very imaginative and within that limited period of time, here as a resident, you have got lot of time, but if you go to your clinical practice where you have got less time, in less time you have to diagnose, not that you, you, will, you, you will have an excuse that I have less time, so I will not examine this, so I have not examined this, I was not able to do this, that is why 
I made the wrong diagnosis, nobody will like, going to excuse you. So, in that scenario, the third component is taken as what are the necessary other system where you believe there could be findings. So, ladies and gentlemen, what I am trying to say that, uh, that the physical examination is also a very essential component. You must have experience, you must have by now experience that many of the physical findings as a clinician it helps you in deciding the diagnosis, most of the point in diagnosis, but many of the points out of them as in history they can also helpful in deciding the treatment. But idea is that whenever you uh, do the physical examination always you stick to these rules that three things first general examination that is important point and then system involved you spend little more time on that and then finally, the other system depending upon your case scenario you have to choose which other system is important and that there you have to spend some time. Because if you start doing reverse order suppose you do the other system first. So, you have examined you took half an hour to examine cardiovascular, musculoskeletal, neurological. So, what you will find? You will find nothing that is why actually these uh, rules have been made after a very thought over process. Not that somebody is te these, these teachings are there for last maybe centuries, many many centuries and these cases have been made accordingly thinking over that what is important, what is less important. So, in that particular time you will be able to do, but, but really the to my understanding physical examination is very essential and very important and it gives you the very important clues either for diagnosis or for treatment of tuberculosis. Thank you.